So if you've been following my channel for a while, you know that I love investing for dividends and passive income. You also know that recently I've been analyzing stocks, both those that I own in my personal portfolio and also those that I do not, but I'm interested in either covering and understanding more, or I just received questions from the community and I want to know more about those particular stocks that, that others are looking at. Anyways, the uh, video today is my stock analysis from a dividend investing perspective of Ford Motor Company. This is a stock that a lot of subscribers have been asking about. And no, I do not own this one in my personal portfolio, and I do not have the intention of adding it to my personal portfolio. That being said, it was a very interesting analysis. I really enjoyed analyzing this stock. I put a lot of time into it, and um, I learned a lot about Ford Motor Company from a dividend investing standpoint. So let's get going and let's jump into Ford. So thanks everyone for being here. I really wanna thank you for these questions. The questions really fuel the content here on my YouTube channel. I am so grateful for the questions. And before we get started today, just a quick note, if you subscribe to my channel, if you like the video, if you comment, all of that, it really, really means the world to me. So thank you, thank you in advance for that. And thank you for all of you who have been holding in there. I know I've been getting a lot of questions about Ford for a while, is it a good dividend stock, is it not? Obviously, everyone needs to answer this question for themselves, but for my personal portfolio, Ford is not the right investment. It is not the right dividend stock for my portfolio, although there are certainly pros and cons with this company. And when I went through the analysis, I actually uncovered a lot of interesting things, a lot of good things about Ford, because going into this, I had a pretty big bias. I think there are people out there, dividend investors, who either really like Ford or they don't like Ford. I fall into the bucket where I just don't like Ford. And so before the analysis, I was almost biased a bit um, based on things that I'd read in the media, based on things from the past. And so anyways, um, looking at the hard facts, looking at the numbers, it was a good exercise for me. And so I want to share both the pros and cons today. So I want to jump right into it. Misinformation. The number one thing that kind of gave me a preconceived bias against Ford Motor Company is this notion of the government bailout. We all remember during the Great Recession, there were, there were banks that were failing and the government was, the US government was helping those banks. But also during that time, there was a lot of news, a lot of media, hey, these auto companies, they're not doing very well. GM, for example, was really struggling. And at the time, the government was making loans. It was bailing out these automakers and Ford really got encapsulated in all of that. And so going into this, my, um, my preconceived bias, I guess, because of what I had heard in the media is that Ford was on the same playing field as GM. Both of them had a lot of problems and they needed the government's help to bail them out. And obviously, if a company needs the government to bail them out, that is generally not a company that I want to invest in for the long run because they just can't stand the test of time on their own. And I'm concerned that during the next recession that might happen again. Anyways, the, there's some misinformation actually. The bailout as it pertained to Ford, when I really researched it, it was not that big of a deal. They took a $5.9 billion government loan in 2009 to retool some of their factories. They took a $9 billion credit line. I don't believe they used that to the best of my research, but this pales in comparison to the bailout, which my understanding in, overall for the auto industry was like an $80 billion plus, dollar, plus or minus dollar bailout. And so this was a, a kind of a, a drop in the bucket as it pertains to the overall bailout. And my understanding based on my most recent research is the bailout mainly pertained to other auto manufacturers other than Ford and Ford fared a lot better. Now, Ford was a big proponent of the bailout. And my understanding of why is Ford relies on other companies to produce parts that they buy. And if the other competitors of Ford are struggling and they're basically going to close shop, that's really bad for Ford because these parts distributors, suppliers, they can't remain competitive. They can't offer Ford a good price. They may not even be able to stay in business if the auto companies aren't, aren't at least maintaining some kind of baseline. And so Ford was a big proponent of the bailout because they wanted all of these suppliers of parts to fare well because it's this whole supply chain issue. And so anyways, when I look back, 
on this, I feel already a little bit better about Ford because they, they didn't really need the bailout, but they kind of needed it in the sense that they couldn't be in an industry that completely went under or else it would have really, really, really hurt them. So this was kind of just useful for clarification. Next, what I started looking at was the dividend. I invest for dividends and passive income. The dividend stream is everything to me. I don't really concern myself as much with capital appreciation, although I like to see some capital appreciation over the long run because it's indicative of a well-run business. We're gonna to get to this in a minute. Ford has not had that. Um, anyways, let's start the dividend though. Last few years, it's been ups and downs. It's been generally pretty good. 60 cents in 2015, $1 in 2016, 65 cents 2017, and 73 cents estimated in 2018. Why is it so lumpy? What it looks like to me is Ford right now has a baseline payout, 15 cents per quarter. However, in Q1 each year, sometimes they will pay a higher dividend, and I mentioned they do that based on results and so it's kind of lumpy and this is why i'm showing it yearly here in some of my other videos i do it more on a quarterly basis to show how the dividend changes by quarter it's kind of lumpy here so fact number one i don't really like lumpy dividends although i can i can make do i have 37 stocks so if it comes a little lumpy i can smooth out the income over the year again the reason i invest is to pay living expenses to pay bills with dividends and so if it's lumpy it can create some issues but I'm okay with that, but here's what's a real deal breaker for me. 2007 through 2011, no dividend. No dividend during these years. During these years of the Great Recession, of the troubles with the auto industry, at least to the best of my knowledge, and how did I learn this? I went to the Ford website. I went to their investor relations section. I looked at all the historical dividends. They allow you to select and toggle by year. When I go to these years, or when I go down the list, there's nothing for these years. So I'm assuming that there was no dividend during these years. And for me, that's a deal breaker. That's a real issue for me when the dividend is, is let alone suspended for a quarter or two, but when it's years on end, that is um, a challenge. And so anyways, the, um, the dividend yield right now actually is quite, um, quite substantial. So we're, we're yielding estimated about 73 cents per share this year in um, in 2018 the current share price is eleven dollars and 43 cents when you take 73 cents you divide by the eleven dollars and 43 cents you get a current yield of about 6.4 percent that is fabulous that is a great dividend yield and this is higher than what yahoo finance shows the reason it's higher is i think yahoo finances is taking the baseline they're taking the 15 cents per quarter which would come out to 60 cents, they're dividing by the current share price. But I get 73 cents because I'm assuming that what they're doing in these January months will probably continue into the foreseeable future. But that said, when I hold for decades upon decades upon decades, yeah, the current yield is enticing to me. I would say that's a pro of the company, but a con is just the simple fact that they, they cut the dividend for all those years. That's a real deal breaker for me. If we hit a, a troubling recession again, I would be concerned. So anyways, um, something else I wanna look at here, price per share. I went back in time, and yes, I cherry picked this. 1993, I looked at the absolute highest price I could find during the year. That said, when one looks at the high water mark in 93 versus now in 2018, 25 years later, I would expect to see some capital appreciation. This company has gone nowhere. It has gone from $11.34 in 93 to $11.44 in 2018. Again, I don't invest for capital appreciation, but I look at capital appreciation as a barometer for how well the company is performing. And if it has not gone anywhere in that much time, that is a indication of some greater issues in, in my personal opinion. That is a greater indication of the type of company I do not want to invest in. So this is, this is a deal breaker for me, just nowhere in 25 years. So what else? Let's look at some something interesting here. International business. This is something I didn't know about Ford. And I think when you're based out of the US, you live in the US like myself. I live here in the Silicon Valley, the Bay Area, California. And you, you hear about Ford Motor Company, you think, wow, this is an iconic American company. And wow, I would imagine most of their automobiles, their trucks, they're sold in the United States. Well, 
That was something I was surprised to see that they do 6.6 .6 million units in 2017 and only 3.0 of those were in North America. So you've got a 3.6 international. That's cool. I like companies that have that international diversification. So certainly I want to be very open-minded here. There are pros and cons. I think the pros so far is they didn't really need the bailout. They pay a hefty current dividend yield of 6.4% plus or minus and they got some good international exposure. I think the cons so far are certainly the dividend cut during all of those years of the Great Recession and um, also that it's gone nowhere in 25 years in terms of the share price. So now let's get into the real um, nuts and bolts of this. Let's get into the numbers. When I look at the numbers for Ford Motor Company, I see some interesting things. Revenue. So first and foremost, revenue back in 2013 was 146 plus or minus a billion dollars or 147. It's gone up to 156.7. So I like that. I like that the revenue has been increasing. I think that's good. I think certainly the revenue is increasing during a time when our economy is doing better. We're on the mend. Something challenging about this industry overall is it's cyclical. This is a big ticket purchase, whether a business is, pur is purchasing a truck or a van from Ford for their business, whether an individual is purchasing an auto, those types of decisions can generally be delayed. If it's a bad economy, one can delay their purchase. If it's a good economy like it is now, revenue is gonna be up, they're gonna be increasing the top line because people are buying cars and businesses are buying trucks. Income before taxes, it's kind of all over the map. Uh, 14 billion in 2013 goes down to 1 billion in 14, up to 8 billion in 17. This is one of the reasons that I personally dislike this company and this industry is, look, and, and I, own, I own cyclical stocks in my portfolio, so I shouldn't just say no to cyclical stocks, but for, for in the scheme of things, I generally try not to have too many cyclical stocks. And I feel like my exposure there is good. I feel like the companies I do have that are cyclical, I like quite a bit better than this company. And the reason I don't like cyclical stocks is just because of this. The numbers can be real lumpy and that can affect the ability for them to grow the dividend over time. It means in general, they've got to keep the payout ratio low for fear that they have a year like 2014 and they don't have enough cash on hand to pay a dividend or pay a high dividend. And so I don't know how quickly they'll be able to grow the dividend from here, given how cyclical the company is. And why is it cyclical? Well, revenue's up, which is good, but the income, I imagine the reason the income, the net income is a little lumpy is, think about it, it's a new model. They're introducing a brand new car model or a brand new truck model. There's a lot of work, innovation, and marketing that goes into launching a new product. I imagine on new product launch years, the, um, the margins get squeezed. I imagine also recalls. We've all heard about these in the news. All of a the sudden there's a major recall. Oops, something is wrong with the airbags or something is wrong with the battery or something is wrong with the engine. They gotta get these cars in and fix them under warranty. And so we're under recall. And so that can take a huge hit to the bottom line. And I imagine the reason some of this lumpiness is because of those factors. And that's a reason, for example, that I don't like this industry quite as much as others. That said, I don't want to completely say that I, I dislike cyclicals because I do own some cyclicals in my portfolio and I hope to cover some of them here, or not hope, I will cover some of them here in the future. And um, I look forward to that very much and maybe we can even compare and contrast how the cyclicals I own are different than Ford. So let's go down, um, net income after taxes. I have before and after because I know there's a lot of weirdness going on with taxes now. And I didn't really find anything actually here after taxes. They're not doing anything weird as of yet, at least as of the 2017 annual report, I don't think, see anything very weird with taxes. But I do see, um, again, 11.9 net income 2013, it goes down in 14, up a little bit, up to 7.6 and 17. So again, it's very lumpy. Diluted earnings per share. The earnings per share in this company were $2.94 in 2013, 31 cents in 2014, $1.84 2015, $1.15, and then 90 cents in 2017. Again, it's all over the map, it's cyclical. Although I imagine it would be much more pronounced if we were actually in a bad economy. And that's the good, that's the interesting thing here. Look how crazy these numbers are up and down in a very good economy. And we're probably getting towards the tail end, in my opinion, of this good economy. At some point, we will have a correction and there could even be, or stock market correction, which would generally coincide with a economic correction or recession. 
Now, if this is what's happening during good times, during bad times, I imagine the EPS could be quite a bit more volatile, maybe even swing negative. And so that's something that concerns me. Although, what I do want to point out here, I'm sorry, in 2070 it wasn't 90 cents, it's $1.90. And I highlighted this. When I take the price per share, which is 11.43, I divide it by $1.90 which is the price earning or the um, earnings per share, I get price earnings, price divided by earnings, price per share divided by earnings per share. That gives you the PE ratio, price earnings, 5.97. This is like a bargain basement PE. So this company, yes, it's gone nowhere in 25 years. It pays a reasonable dividend, although I don't know how secure it is because even recently they cut it for years on end. That being said, it's kind of being priced at a bargain basement here. I feel like this company is being priced because everyone out there, probably like myself, has these, these preconceived notions that they needed a bailout and probably just has some negative, negative thoughts towards, towards this company as an investment in the sense that there was a lot that went down during the Great Recession. There's, it's quite cyclical on the earnings per share. And so I imagine the reason it's priced at bargain basement is people are fearful of the future and other people are not willing to bid it up. It's not trading up because people are concerned. And so if one is a deep value investor, I would say, in my opinion, Ford is trading at one of those deep values right now at a PE of only 5.97. That's quite low. That's just quite, quite low. That being said, if they have a year like 2014, the, the PE goes up again. And so again, one has to factor in how it's cyclical. So anyways, let's go to operating margin. I actually calculated the operating margin. For me, it came in when I, when I, when I calculated off my numbers more around like a high fours, but they're saying, in their report that it's a 5.0 in 2017, 6.7 in 2016. So this is a company that has very low margins. Typically for me, an operating margin less than 15% is generally not a company I want to invest in. I like them even in the 20s. That being said, look, there's different industries. You know, every industry is different and this is probably characteristic of this industry i own industries in my portfolio where operating margins are lower so i, I want to be honest and transparent with myself here that said just when i see numbers like this it's a red flag it's a cause for concern just in, in i'm not saying ford's doing anything wrong i'm just saying as an industry being in a 5.0 percent operating margin industry i don't know if that's for me and so that's kind of a con that's a con of this analysis what else leverage did a video here on GE. I'm going to link in the description below. I dislike GE because of uh, one of the reasons, well, many reasons, but one of the reasons because of GE credit. GE has a bank and they're losing a lot of money on it. Ford has a bank too. The good thing about Ford's bank is it's actually making money, but they're doing auto loans. They're loaning money so that consumers and potentially businesses can buy their, their goods. The bank is doing well now, um, but what happens when the next recession hits? Are people Look, if a consumer is faced with a choice, are they gonna pay their rent to have a roof over their head? Are they gonna pay for, to get food on the table? Or let's say there's not enough dollars, are they gonna to choose to pay, make their car payment? In my opinion, when the next recession comes, they could see some issues. That, that being said, when I look at their, the FICO scores, I think they had that in the annual report, I look at the, the uh, characteristics behind their loan portfolio. To me, it looks like actually a pretty solid portfolio. That said, it's just not a business that I like I like investing in. Sure, I understand investing in a bank because a bank, when they loan money, it's secured by real estate. And real estate has tangible value. Even in a down market, I believe in real estate. And it's not a depreciating asset. Well, it is in, in, for tax purposes, but for ownership purposes and investment purposes, I don't view real estate as a depreciating asset. Cars are totally a depreciating asset. So. If something happens with their loan portfolio during a down market and they, they, re, they confiscate these cars, are they going to be able to sell them? No. I mean, for pennies, pennies on the dollar, fractional value. And so what was interesting with the leverage is it's an 8.7. So their equity versus the amount of dollars loaned out, there's an 8.7 leverage. That just seemed like a lot of leverage to me. And the leverage has been coming down over time but it just seems like an awful lot of leverage. It's certainly a lot more leverage than your average real estate, um, real estate ba lending institution bank would, would, uh, would consider taking on with your average real estate loan. And so that was something that, that concerned me. 
So next I want to talk about assets and liabilities. In this company, they have quite a bit of assets. They have $257 billion worth of assets. That seems amazing. And um, that's as in comparison to a market cap of $45 billion. But the fact of the matter here, like GE, and I'll li again link in the description below to that video, they operate both as a company that produces cars, but also as a bank. They have that lending arm. And when one lends money, assets will be inflated and liabilities too, because it's just a different way of looking at things. They're carrying all of those loans on their books. Of the $257 billion worth of assets, they've got $15.9 billion of auto debt and financial services debt at $138 billion carried as assets, because this is debt these are notes that they hold, debt that is owed to them, so it's an asset. And similarly, you'll see that showing up in the liabilities. Anyways, when one looks at the assets and liabilities, it's not as if it appears. When one backs out all of those loans, the tangible cash that is left is not so impressive. Although what I would say is they have 18 billion in cash, they have 20 billion in marketable securities, so I thought that was pretty good. They definitely have a buffer there, but again, it, one definitely needs to keep into mind that a lot of what they're calling assets, especially these, this debt that's owed to them, and especially the inventory as well, which is carried at about $10 billion, is it really worth that, that much? I don't know. What concerns me with this company is they've got a lot of debt that is owed to them, and Again, what if another recession is coming? That is just something that concerns me. And I think that's why the market is giving it a 5.97 PE ratio. So let me summarize here. There are pros and cons. I would say the biggest pros is one could get a good starting yield, a reasonable starting, not only reasonable, a hefty starting yield of 6.4%. I think one gets a company that is world renowned as a as a great uh, manufacturer of automobiles that does business all around the world and actually does more business internationally than in North America. That's awesome. One gets a, uh, a company that's been around a long time. Hey, they, they had some challenges during the Great Recession, but they, they made it. <laughs> they made it out the other end. So I don't know if that's a pro or con. It's kind of a more of a con, uh, maybe neutral. But um, those, I would say, are some of the pros. I think the cons with this company is they cut the dividend. I think the con is that well, you know they did have they are in an industry that required a bailout. That's not good. They um, have a lot of cyclicality in their numbers, even during a really good time. What's going to happen when times get bad? They have this issue, in my opinion. Whereas I believe it's better managed than with GE they still are doing these loans, these auto loans, and everything looks good now during uh, 2018. But what happens when the recession hits? Will consumers and businesses make good on their loans? And so these are some of the pros and cons. For me, it's a no-go. There are too many other stocks out there that I could own. Another big con is just operating margin is quite low. I generally try to avoid companies that have lower operating margins because there's just less uh, uh, room for room for risk or less less margin of safety if you will with only a uh, operating margin about five percent there's very little that can go wrong or else the company's uh, profits just just collapse as you saw in 2014. so that's what i think about ford for me it's a no-go i did really enjoy doing this analysis though because it gave me a greater perspective on ford as a company i actually feel better about the company than i did going into the analysis i i really going into this thought, wow, this is this is not a good company just based on what I have heard. And so it was sometimes the, the moral is one has to look at the numbers, the facts, to really understand uh, all of, everything that comes behind a company and not to let the emotions get the better of them. That being said, when one invests, I do fully believe that one has to look at the facts, but also the emotions, because one when one invests for dividends, for the long term, forever, it's really important to stand behind the company that one invests in and to have that staying power. And it's just really hard if emotionally I don't have the attachment to this company. Thank you for hanging in there if you made it this long. Thank you for the question. I know a lot of you have been asking about Ford Motor Company. So excited to do this analysis at last. If you have questions, please keep them coming. And not only here on YouTube, but I'm on Instagram. I'm gonna link in the description below. If you wanna connect with me on Instagram, you can find me there. And I'm gonna link in the description too to my video about GE, because I think that's another interesting one, another interesting stock analysis 
to look at. And I thank all of you for hanging in there. Before I leave today, just a friendly disclaimer. This is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you are gonna go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult a licensed financial advisor first. Thanks again. I will see you in the next dividend investing video.